Welcome to episode 108 of the Search with Canada podcast recorded on Friday the 23rd of April 2021. As usual, my name is Mark Williams-Cook still, and we're going to be talking today with Emily Brady, who is Senior Manager of Local SEO Solutions at Milestone, and we are going to be talking about, funnily enough, local SEO. We have a really interesting interview. We talk about what it takes to get ranked in Google map packs. We talk about problems with spam or crap on the map as people refer to it on Twitter. We talk about the differences in ranking between normal organic results and in those map packs and how to make the best possible landing pages. Before we get to that interview, I want to tell you that this episode is very kindly sponsored by Sitebulb. Sitebulb, if you haven't heard of it, is a desktop-based Windows or Mac, whichever you have, SEO auditing tool. We've used it for years at the agency. It's absolutely fundamental to what we do. I was actually recording a training course today or more of our training course on SEO today. And actually, we use Sitebulb in that as well. So today I was taking people through how to audit their HTTPS setup, finding non-secure pages, finding mixed secure, non-secure pages and how Sitebulb makes that really easy. And just from this podcast, actually, I got a message uh, a few days ago from a user saying, hey, Mark, just wanted to let you know, after listening to Search with Candor, we used the trial version of Sitebulb and says their company name, bought the pro version. We're getting so much value for it. So really pleased we can introduce more people to Sitebulb. It's absolutely brilliant. Sitebulb.com forward slash SWC will get you an extended 60 day trial. No credit card or anything required. So no excuse. Download it. Give it a go and see how you like it. And today we are joined by Emily Brady, who is Senior Manager of Local SEO Solutions. Emily, thank you so much for joining us on Search with Canda. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, excited to be here today. For those that don't know you, before we get going, so we're going to be talking obviously about local SEO today, which is a specialist area of yours. Do you just want to give a quick introduction to, I guess, how maybe how you got into SEO and a little bit about the role that you currently do? Yeah, definitely. So I have been doing SEO in some capacity for about nine years now. And I initially started at a company called Scorpion. I got into SEO doing content writing, actually. And then over the years, that kind of evolved into on-site and then, you know, everything, uh, everything everything from there. But largely that entire time I was working with local businesses. So anything from SMBs up to franchises, et cetera. So now uh, local SEO is kind of my niche. That's what I'm really focusing on uh, for both anything from single location all the way up to really large multi-location national brands and whatnot. Uh, So that's kind of the abbreviated version of my journey. I'm currently at a company called uh, Milestone, which offers both software and services in uh, SEO, digital marketing. And I get to help head up the local side of that, which is really exciting. So I'm working on both the product side, which is so fun, but then also getting to onboard and work with some of our strategic clients as well. Brilliant. That's a really well done, succinct intro. Uh, you, you warned me you might be a bit of a rambler, but that was really good. Um, so <laughs> when we're going to talk about local SEO and, and I just wanted to, I guess, to introduce the subject because, you know, you've said you've been doing SEO yourself like pretty much a decade now. And one of the things I've noticed over that time is, is this change in search engine results um, as we've marched towards you know, um, what we call, you know, these universal search results where in some cases, you know, and it certainly makes SEOs argue, we're getting instant answers in search results. We're getting knowledge graph stuff, featured snippets. And a lot of the time we're getting, you know, top news stories and local, local came along, you know, really, really early um, in this journey. And I've just seen it 
grow and grow and grow. So originally we were triggering these kind of local results for when people were searching for, you know, something near me or when they were using geographical terms. And what I've personally noticed is that now Google is kind of inferring when it thinks there's probably local intent, even if it's not specified. So a great example for that for me is in the UK, at least, it, even if I just type SEO agency, the first thing I get is a map pack come out because Google's like, well, people seem to want to want people near them. So I'm going to show this. Is that something that you've observed in terms of local SEO in that it is becoming more important and it, it's it's widening its reach within the kind of remit of SEO? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that what we're seeing and we'll continue to see, right? I mean, nine years is a long time in uh, Google years, but I think what we're seeing is Google is becoming more intuitive about understanding the way people search and what search intent is. So having having a local pack show up, that kind of tells you, okay, Google's assuming that this is a local a local search, like someone needs a local business to help them. Uh, and that becomes even more obvious with certain types of businesses like a plumbing company or any, you know, landscaping, things like that. But even even in the past year, the concept of local SEO during COVID has kind of changed because everything we, everything is based on proximity at this point. In the past, I used to drive to work and then you know I'd be hitting up coffee shops on the other side of town. But now my proximity bubble is so much smaller. So local SEO has become even more important, I would say, in the last year because businesses that are proximate to their searcher's house is really where it's at. And obviously that's going to change as things start reopening and whatnot. But I think local will be important as long as people need local services. And local businesses, whether they're large enterprise locations or SMBs, are a really important part of the economy and part of our communities and whatnot. So I think that Google's emphasis on evolving those search result pages is smart because that's largely what people are looking for online. I think it's something like close to half of searches on Google are have some kind of local intent, generally speaking. So yeah, local local is important. And I would I would expect to see it changing more uh, in the future. And even even in the past year, again, with COVID, it was kind of really obvious how, how Google started introducing things like health and safety attributes on GMB and all of that good stuff to make it easier for consumers to get what they need online before they visit a location because the chances of someone showing up to a store that's actually closed is a lot higher during COVID and all of that kind of stuff, which kind of shows you that at the end of the day, users are the ones driving search, right? Because our lives changed and then that forced Google to adapt. So I think that just kind of really emphasizes the importance of local as an industry. And then also how at the end of the day, like local is for is for customers above everything else. And we even saw Google having to change and accommodate customers because customers' lives changed in the past year. So um yeah, kind of a long answer for a short question, but yeah, I would say <laughs> yes, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, I was quite impressed. We we covered in the podcast some of those changes Google rolled out to Google My Business. Um, like there's some we've applied for our, our agency. Like we can list if on-site services are available or if it's remote only. I know they changed some things for kind of restaurants, seeing if they offer delivery because that was something, as you said. Um, consumers really started looking for like, okay, this is the usual place I would go to eat. Now I want to find out because of COVID, can they deliver? So it was interesting seeing how quickly Google could could pace with those changes. So with our SEO hats on then and talking about local SEO, I think the first thing that comes to people's minds when we talk about local SEO is just kind of just managing their listing in Google My Business. What else is there to local SEO that people should be thinking about? Yeah, this is this is one of my favorite questions and favorite topics. <laughs> but uh, obviously, GMB is a huge part of local, right? That's a huge driver of traffic and not just traffic to your website, but traffic to your business in some capacity. But also, at the end of the day, when you think about it, local SEO tends to kind of get categorized as this subset of this larger SEO umbrella. But then when you compare that to other areas of digital, like no one says local digital marketing, right? So if you're doing SEO for a local business, it doesn't matter what activity or strategy you're implementing, like that's local SEO if you're trying to reach local customers. So really any anything that you're doing. So yeah, listings are going to be part of that. You know, Google My Business, your listings management, yes. But we tend to think of those as local SEO 
just because they are unique to local SEO. But in reality, everything else is going to impact that as well, like your landing pages, uh, what type of content you have on your website, what are you giving customers there on your actual domain, uh, your website performance, your schema markup, all of that good stuff. All of that is just as much local SEO as listings management is because the goal is the same, right? You're trying to reach those local customers. So Again, like it's going to be anything that you're doing that's looking to achieve that larger object objective of getting a local business or a location for a, uh, lo a large local enterprise business, uh, more customers. I think that differentiation between the, well, well, we'll simplify and say two sets of results. And by two sets of results, I mean kind of map packs and, you know, GMB listings and the 10 blue links, if you like, the organic results that we have been used to. I've had a lot of questions previously around the differences in how we can rank in those two different sets of results, right? So the the 10 blue links kind of thing has been with us for a long time. And, you know, we, there's lots of people we've talked about page rank and we know about on-site content and all this kind of stuff. And to me, and I think, well, to many people, we can see that how Google is ranking people in those listing results is slightly different because we see different companies obviously appearing in there. So do you have any insight into kind of what factors Google is using um, with those local search listings and how important they might be compared to each other um, compared to how we're looking to sort of, you know, classic SEO, if you like? Yeah, yeah. Classic SEO. I like that. Um, yeah, this is, you know, one of those things that it's kind of like, really frustrating when you have a business and you're like, we got them ranking in the like quote unquote organic classic blue links. You know, they're there. The content's great. You know, we got some good solid backlinks that we earned, all this good stuff. And then they never show up in the map, map pack. But I think, you know, at an industry level, the general understanding is that it's actually a pretty limited handful of items that influence your rankings in the local pack. And that's largely going to be things like your business name, uh, the primary category, uh, maybe your secondary categories too, but the primary one primarily, uh, and proximity. And then um, oh, there's a fourth one that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. Business name, category, proximity, and reviews is going to be another one. But when you think about it, really the only thing that you can absolutely control is going to be your primary category. So it's a bit of a catch-22 there because so much of it is not things that you can actively go in and optimize unless you're willing to actually change your business name to something that has a keyword in it, which isn't plausible for everyone. And if everyone does that, there's still only three spots. So you know, that that is kind of challenging that way. But you, when you think about it, local has kind of always been entity based. That way, Google's not just looking at these like text based items, like um, keywords on a page for to rank in, in the maps pack. So it's, a, it's, I guess it's more complicated that way. But then on the actual execution side, you're somewhat limited as far as those really big ticket things that you can change to immediately see, see an increase. So I would say, you know, the smart thing to do there is one, make sure what you can control is updated, obviously. And then just really fill out everything, leverage every possible opportunity for optimization on your uh, profile, even if it's not like a direct ranking factor, just to take up as much space in the knowledge panel as possible, et cetera. But then leverage uh, leverage your on-site too. Like if you're linking to a really strong landing page, that's probably going to help you. Uh, stuff like that. So just make sure you're hitting it from all angles and uh, cross your fingers and say, hey, I hope Google rewards rewards the fact that my business is the best one. But yeah, local's tricky that way because it's very competitive. It's really volatile. And those top quote ranking factors aren't things that we can always control. So it's kind of a matter of casting a broader net and just doing all of those little things on the side that uh, may or may not make an impact. But over time, aggregate and cumulatively hopefully will uh, start to implement some kind of change. One thing I used to hear people talking about quite a lot in terms of local SEO and listing rankings was this NAP citation. So name, address, phone number, and making sure that your business name, address, and phone number is the same. And it's in multiple places across the web because Google's kind of using that to you know, bonify who you are. Is is that still a thing you think contributes or it, it, was it something that ever did or was that a bit of a kind of red herring there? 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it was a red herring so much, but you know what? It would be really exciting if it was. That would be some good uh, SEO <laughs> news. <laughs> but I do kind of think it is now to a certain extent because there's so many other opportunities out there, right? Like in the past, when I say local has always been entity-based, that's because Google's gathering information from across the internet about your business and then drawing assumptions from it about what your business is and for what search, revo- search results you might be relevant. So In the past, because like go back to 2012, search was significantly more text based at that time. It was Google's crawling text on websites. That's what it understood the best. And so the text it was gathering about your website from other websites is going to be your URL, your name, your address, and your phone number. So really that NAP consistency, yeah, that was important because that's kind of like the biggest piece of information you could give to search engines. But now there's so much more that you can provide to actually present your business as an entity. All of those attributes on GMB, all of the schema markup you can be adding on your landing pages, all that good stuff. Google is a lot more intuitive about understanding, okay, how do all of these pieces fit together to create the larger whole of this local business? Even things as simple as um, you know, attributes like, is this business uh, women-owned or do they have indoor dining right now? All of those are pieces of this larger entity and it's it's data that you can feed directly to Google. So leveraging that I think is really important. Um, and I would say, yeah, make sure that your name, address, and phone number is accurate. But at the end of the day, Google doesn't need like 80 plus mentions of that to understand where you are located. You can feed them that information directly in Google My Business and in your website markup and all of that good stuff. So sure, if people are using those websites, it's important to have the NAP updated there because then they'll, if not, they'll be calling the wrong phone number. But it's not as important, I would say, to get visibility because Google has become more intuitive about understanding your business and they don't need help from these other listings as much to to do that. That makes perfect sense. That makes really good sense. We spoke um, several episodes ago now to Jason Barnard and went into some depth about schema and entities. And I always find it really exciting talking about that aspect of Google and you know how they're building this graph and they're understanding everything. But then I'm, <laughs> I'm very, uh, very quickly grounded. So there is a hashtag I've seen on Twitter quite a few times, which is hashtag crap on the map. <laughs> and this is referring to uh, Google, my business results to map pack listings, where there, there's obviously a spam issue there. You mentioned before about the name of the business, obviously being a, a ranking factor. Um, and I think this is a similar similar line, I guess, to how exact match domains have used to work really well and still work quite well in terms of Google's have got to make that decision from a search intent point of view as to, is this a navigational search? You know, is this person just being lazy and typing the name of the thing they want to find? So this means that when people decide to put keywords in their business name on their listing, Google just tends to, to rank them, right? And I see loads of examples. It seems worse actually in the States from what I've seen than in the UK. But this, you know, does, is this a problem at the mo- moment for local SEO? And does does Google action it? Because I seem to see a lot of people sort of complaining about this kind of behavior. Yeah, you know, it definitely is a problem. I mean, it's a problem unless your actual business name is an exact match keyword, in which case then it's great. Um, but it's definitely a problem because they're really isn't any proactive effort taken on Google's side to get rid of those. And I think there are two, there are like two types of spam that we're talking about. The first one is, okay, maybe, maybe this business hired uh, an SEO strategist or company that is willing to create spam lead gen listings for them. And they're going to a legit business. They're just getting those leads by like cheating the algorithm. So that's one issue, which is frustrating for for those of us who are like trying to do it by the book. Um, But then the other problem is you can also have fake businesses who are actually then cheating people out of their money because of it. Like if it's it's a lead quote lead gen listing and then someone shows up for a service, bills them for it, and then never actually completes it. Like that's another problem that happens too. So both of those, one of them obviously much worse than the other one because that's actually scamming people. The other one is just kind of 
cheating the algorithm to get more leads to a real business. Um, but regardless, I mean, the thing is Google doesn't actively monitor this, but they do allow SEOs to take action and we can suggest edits, we can report spam, uh, things like that. So I always think about it like, <laughs> this is this is kind of a silly analogy, but like reporting spam on in the maps pack is kind of like the Dr. Pimple Popper of SEO because it's so satisfying to go in there and like fix this stuff because you can actually fix it, right? It's like, ah, yeah, we got that guy taken down who was bumping my client down a couple of spots. And so, yeah, you can, you can take action like that. Um, I mean, there are people who devote a lot of time and effort to this because it really does make a difference, right? And Google isn't taking it enough action. They're kind of relying on people in the search industry or quote users. Um, but users are not, users aren't going to like spend all day editing the maps. Like that's just, it's largely SEOs, I would assume. Um, but yeah, the, Google kind of relies on us to actually report those on an ad hoc basis. So that's, that's not really taking action, uh, but it is, it's unfortunate and it's very frustrating when you like get rid of one and then five more pop back up and it's still like, oh, my client, my client should be performing better because of this. But um, at the end of the day, yeah, you can, you can report stuff, you can get spam taken down um, and Google is not going to proactively do that for you. So if you notice that being a problem, like in your area with your clients, I would say, yeah, like set aside, carve out some time to go in there and find those listings, do your research, uh, look it up and see like, do they have a business license that's legit? Like, is it up to date? Is this fake? Call the phone number and see who picks up, stuff like that. Uh, just try to do a little detective work and then get it taken down if it's not legit because Google's not going to do that for you. I'll put a link for our listeners in the show notes. So you can get our show notes at search.withcanda.co.uk. There is a Google My Business re redressal form, they call it. Um, if you do find people doing something particularly naughty, uh, like Emily said, if they've set up kind of like fake listings that are trying to con people out of money, you can report those through that form. Um, and there is the ability to like suggest edits, right? So if you had a competitor say that added in a load of keywords on their business name, you can suggest an edit basically that they just change that right to their business name. Now, for those listening, does that mean that the owner has to approve that change or will that just go through or is it account based? Like what what can happen in, in, in that instance? So interestingly, Google gives way too much power to people just suggesting edits uh, in a way that is advantageous in this type of a situation. So, you know, if they're if they're trying to cheat the system, like obviously they wouldn't approve that effort. So if Google deems it to be yeah, this should be updated to not be the keyword, um, then they're going to accept that edit at their discretion, essentially. Um, but yeah, I mean, the same thing goes for like legit businesses too, which is kind of another problem. If I if I as a, as a customer go in and mark a business as closed or something like that, or temporarily closed or open when it's actually temporarily closed, Google tends to kind of just accept those. And then later the business can go in and fix it. But they're pretty trusting when it comes to to crowdsourcing data like that. Not always, but um, yeah, well, definitely when it comes to updating those really spammy business names and whatnot, they tend to either approve or reject your request. And it's not up to the actual listing owner at that point. That might be interesting for people listening, because I think quite a few people, business owners don't know that. <laughs> Um, one of the questions we uh, has, has come up a few times, so we've done a few like live SEO Q and A's and something that regularly comes up is around companies with multiple locations, but kind of only one website, if you like, and they have one contact page. And when we speak to them about local SEO, they're saying, well, how do I do that? Should I have multiple entries? So they've got multiple physical presences, but just one site. How should they be setting up a page for each physical presence on their site? What's kind of the best practice for, for people in that situation? So I think it will depend somewhat on how many locations you have and also how effective is your current strategy. So if I have like two locations in one larger metropolitan area, maybe I don't need individual location pages if I'm doing pretty well, if I'm getting enough leads, if I'm, you know, maybe ranking for those like big ticket keywords that I want. But uh, just kind of as a baseline when it comes to I have one website and I have multiple locations, your options are really going to be 
yeah, set up, set up unique. If each location provides unique value to customers, then you should have a unique page to pr- serve that value to them because then that'll get picked up by Google and you then stand to rank for more terms. You stand to get clicks for more keywords and things like that. So really it's kind of a question of subfolders or subdomains, but really just setting up, setting up your location pages. Um, most of the time, clients tend to already have something kind of in place. So you're probably working with something at this point, right? Like there's going to be some kind of content there. Very rarely is it totally from scratch, but depending on what path you choose, really the goal is make sure that each location is providing unique value to to its customers. Otherwise, there is no point in having unique location pages. So let's say I see I see a lot of businesses not leveraging this as much as they could, but like if I am um if I'm a bank or something like that and I have like five locations in one city, I can have unique information on there because maybe maybe there's a handful of ATMs at this one, but this one has a drive-through ATM and then maybe I can have a staff bio about like who's the general manager here, like who's the person who's in charge of making sure that our customers feel seen and heard. If they have a bad experience, all of that kind of stuff can go on those unique location pages and provide value that I can almost guarantee your competitors aren't providing because it takes a lot of effort to generate that type of content. So um, yeah, setting up, setting up those location pages and just giving as much information as possible, like all those attributes that you're adding on GMB with the click of a button, add those to your website too, because the more the more info and the more value you provide to potential customers, the fewer excuses they have to go to a competitor. So just making sure that each location page has some kind of unique value on it and isn't largely boilerplate content is going to be the key to actually seeing results that way. Um, I think a lot of the time, especially when you start getting like really large enterprise sites, it can be hard to do that at scale because you can't necessarily automate it. Like I wish I had some like hot tips and tricks on how to like make to automate this process. But at the end of the day, if there's like a different staff member you're highlighting at each location to create that unique value, you're just going to have to put in the work to do it. And maybe it's a gradual process, but it also definitely pays off because that's not something that a lot of businesses do. So, you know, and every, every industry is going to be different too. Like if I, if I'm like a bakery or like retail or something like that, I can have like an inventory feed or like specials that might be unique to each location. So any kind of like truly unique value and uh, differentiating factors that you can put on that page that is going to provide value to your customers, add that to your location pages. Like that's, what's going to make them the most successful. See, I think that's, that's really, really good advice. So I've seen many, uh, GMB listings that have led to a very kind of Spartan contact page form with pretty much no other information on it. So if you're getting those, um, multiple locations as emily said work on those landing pages another another question about that we we've mentioned it a couple of times or you've mentioned a couple of times i haven't we haven't explored it yet you've mentioned schema what kind of schema should people be considering specifically around local yeah so this this actually ties back to like yeah i have mentioned schema a couple times i do i do love talking about schema um but it also ties back to that original concept of like any seo you're doing is local seo if it's for local customers so yes there is local business schema and subsets of that that you can uh, mark up on your website and you absolutely should if you are a local business but also mark up everything else that is a, an opportunity so like those those bios that i talked about you can add person schema you can add that kind of information you can mark up your like promotional offers, things like that. Um, mark up, add structured data to everything on the page that is a structured data opportunity. And then if you find yourself not having any opportunities, okay, then maybe you need to generate some content, like create content to, to give yourself that opportunity. So really schema, like audit your content, see what you can mark up, compare that against what's available. And if you come up a little bit short, then use that as a content gap analysis and start building out your pages more so that now you have more opportunities. Um, Another really good one that I think is probably, it's not underutilized, but might be underutilized on location pages or local landing pages pretty often is FAQ schema. I love FAQ schema. It's great. As a user, I love FAQ schema because then I can get answers right there in the search result pages from that rich result. Um, But it's also, it it requires you to have good substantial content on the page as well. So that's another great one. And we see that a lot uh, for on websites, but 
it doesn't, it can be like unique to that location. You can u- utilize that schema that is not specific to local to actually add value to your local SEO strategy. So any, really anything, just like audit what you got, see, okay, what, what structured data opportunities exist, and then also use that as a content gap analysis to build more content and start adding more schema. Um, the possibilities are really only limited by the available schema types, right? And I think there's, I mean, there's thousands. There's just a lot out there. So yeah, it takes a little bit of work to dive in and figure out what's available. And it is going to be unique to a lot of different industries, but um, definitely something that I think should be leveraged on those location pages. Like you, I'm I'm a big fan of schema and <clears throat> the advice that we tend to give to clients strategically is even when... Google's kind of saying, well, we're not doing so much with this schema at the moment. So obviously there's certain types of schema you mentioned, like the FAQ stuff that gets you rich results. Um, I think this is going to be the building blocks for a lot of what happens next, especially when, you know, we move further away from people having to search for stuff and then themselves have to pick out what is the best page that might have the answer to what they're looking for to when Google has got and other search engines hopefully have this better understanding of what entities are, how they're related, and they can just answer the question. We can get closer to kind of just shouting at our TVs and stuff to to get the answers that we want about businesses. And I think if you've already got that schema in place, that that's like a good long-term strategy. So you're not just doing the bare minimum for what is required for today. So I think it's really, really real, really good advice you've given there. My last question for you before we wrap up, because we're coming up to about half an hour now, is just actually around uh, benchmarking. How how do people, should people go about benchmarking their local SEO presence and, and what's changing there and what's happening with competitors? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This, this is a good question, but kind of a bad question for the, for 2020 and 2021, (laughs) because all of our year over year data is completely ruined, uh, with the exception of like, well, no, there, I don't think there are really any exceptions. The, the only industry I saw that was not hugely impacted and only impacted immediately at first was, uh, home services because stuff breaks around your house, whether or not you're driving to the office. Um, but uh, I think there are, you know, uh, not not including COVID into that equation. I think there are a couple things to take into consideration here. Um, but in an ideal situation, what what you want to do is understand what your goals are. So, you know, I do is your client wanting to rank? Are they just wanting more revenue? Like what matters to them? And then map those goals to specific KPIs and start gathering that information. So the the other caveat here is most people, most businesses are already going to have an idea of what they think those KPIs should be. So sometimes it's like, I only care about ranking in the maps pack. That is the only thing that matters to me. Well, in that situation, okay, just have a conversation, maybe realign and show them like, hey, we can get value from some other metrics too. Let's, let's benchmark those as well, just to see down the road how that impacts your growth. Um, the other thing to take into consideration too is going to be what industry are you in as far as what metrics you really want to kind of drop a pin in and see how they move. So um, I'm thinking specifically of like, like let's take a, an attorney, for example. Um, an attorney, like you have the opportunity to rank in the maps and you also have the opportunity to rank in organic. And generally speaking, there are some listings showing up in the 10 blue links, which you should be in those two. But there are still going to be like four to six opportunities to also rank on page one. But in other industries, like if you look at um, hospitality, for example, it can be really challenging to push down those like online travel agencies like Expedia and Hotels.com and whatnot, it's going to be a lot more challenging to be ranking in in those 10 blue links. So maybe start your benchmarking with a little bit more GMB insights, like look at your impressions and visibility that way, look at your direct bookings, things like that instead. So take industry factors into consideration, like understand what is reasonable and then uh, uh, yeah, start from there, work the, work with the client, understand like, hey, what are your goals? And then kind of map that to what you see to be the most important metrics and what is reasonable uh, to actually see growth in um, the fastest and in the long run as well. Perfect. Emily, thank you so much for your time. Where, where can people find you online if they want to connect with you? I am on Twitter at uh, Plot Boilers. So P-L-O-T Boilers. I won't ask where that name came from that's kind of kind of random. no it's 
I, I will tell you where the name came from because you're the second okay. person to ask. For a long time, no one asked. And I was like, I guess it just makes sense to people. So it'll be fine. Um, but no, so that is a kind of a like a nod to the fact that I like books. So a pot boiler is a book that an author writes just I mean, not just, but like generally for the sake of generating income, right? Because they know it's going to sell based on their, um, just on their uh, recognition or fame. So that's a pot boiler, right? To keep the pot boiling. But so I change it to plot boilers because a couple years ago, well, now I like more like eight to 10 years ago, whenever I first logged onto Twitter, <laughs> I was like, oh, plot boilers, that's a fun pun. And I had recently started like appreciating books just as genre fiction opposed to only like going after the classics because I tended to like lean on uh, classic fiction more than anything else. So that's kind of, it's a not it's a nod to the fact that I like books and I will read pretty much anything, whether it be a pot boiler genre fiction, like if it's fun, it's good reading. Um, so yeah, kind of a long explanation for a very short Twitter handle, but that's where it comes from. <laughs> I loved it. That was really interesting and I had no idea what a pot boiler was and now I know. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, we're going to be back in one week's time, which will be Monday the 3rd of May. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe, share it with a friend, all of that lovely stuff. And apart from that, I hope you all have a lovely week. <laughs>